And today, uh, I think, is the last day of 21 days of prayer and fasting. We'll probably get a bigger cheer for this than, <laughs> than baptisms. And, um, yeah, and everyone's done what they wanted to do. And um, I remember there was a point last week that God sometimes, in the passage we read, sometimes gives us what we need before he gives us what we want in the story we had. And this, this series, and uh, so I, I, I just pray that there's been significant moments in the 21 days. And I, and I just loved the John readings. I loved the devotionals. I did the last one this morning. And uh, if you haven't done those, um, just jump in and do them 21 days, 21 chapters. And it's just such a great reading. And this series we're in now, this is the last one of three, and it's called Be the Church. The church is not a building, the church is people. And it's been very intentional, it's been tied to Vision Sunday, we've had Vision Sunday over four days, or four weeks, and the 21 days, and I tell you what, there's never been a time when the world needs the church more than it needs it now. And I, uh, I've said this uh, when we came back from COVID, you know, a rise and shine. This is the greatest opportunity we've had as the world uh, moves into darkness and to that time of tribulation that the Bible told us it's coming and we do not have to fear. Fear not. And so today, uh, Be the Church Part 3. Uh, and we've done this series on, on purpose, uh, linked to Vision Sunday. And, and uh, the first week we talked about what if we were passionately devoted, if we were a passionately devoted church? What if we were ridiculously generous church? And I brought some people up the front and uh, showed you what ridiculously generous looked like. And ridiculously generous isn't necessarily rich. And then what if we were unapologetically shared the love of Jesus? And then last week we, we looked at uh, a precious chapter in Mark 2 and I want to say thank you. I got so much feedback from that. Um, chapter 1 email came and had pasta for lunch. And I thought, here we go. And uh, they love the CRC version of the scriptures. The CRC is my initial. And there were five key points in that, in that passage, that, in the passage that represented what I think five groups of people in the church. People who have a need people who care, people who are preoccupied and they don't see the need behind them. We have the critics and we have everyone in need of God's grace. Oh yeah, all right. And so today uh, we want to, I want to go back to conclude this series back into the, chap the book of Acts because I think there's something significant there that we can pull out of there to learn that I think that the church has drifted off course. And I had a friend who loved sailing, and he said to me, Colin, you've only, I can sail from um, Los Angeles to Hawaii. I only have to be one degree off, and I miss it. And sometimes when we drift, it's just one degree of drift, but we miss where we want it to be. And so I thought, well, right, we'll start right in the very beginning. I want to teach you an important point. Some of you will know this, some of you may not. And in, when I say in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. And it starts with in the beginning. So we don't understand all about God. We don't understand all about eternity. This, is, this, this eternity is eternity. And at somewhere in eternity, God jumped in and created the world. And I want to teach you something. So when your Bible translates from uh, Hebrew or, or Greek to English, our English sometimes doesn't have the words that explain accurately what it's saying. So in your English translation, it will say, in the beginning, God. That's a correct translation. But what you miss there is it's actually, uh, the Hebrew word is Elohim. And it's a plural noun. What does that mean? Well, I didn't pass English at anything, so it means there's more than one. I want you to lock on to that, Okay. And, uh, and Elohim, in fact, if you wanted to do a small group study, you could do a small group study just on the names of God for a whole term. It would be a very rich study to do. And, um, and so when God said, let there be light, there was light, and God saw that it was good, I want you to lock onto that. 
it was good. Who likes good? Yeah. Day one. And also notice in this calendar that a new day always starts at sunset. A new day never starts at morning. We start our days in morning, but in, this, in the creation, the new day always starts at sunset. And what does it start with? A meal and rest. There's a reason for that. And then God said, let there be space between the waters and separate the waters and the heavens and the waters and the earth. And God called the space sky and the evening passed and morning came, marking the second day, day two. And then God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together in one place so dry ground may appear. And what, that is what happened. And God called the dry ground land and the waters sea. And God saw that it was... I want you to lock onto that. And when God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed bearing plant and trees and grow seeds and bearing fruit, these seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. Verse 12, and the land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed bearing plants and trees with seed bearing fruit. Their seed produced plants and trees and the same kind. And then God saw that it was... You've got it. And evening passed and morning came, marking the third day. Now, can I teach you a little lesson here? If you ever go to Israel, you'll notice they have weddings on a Tuesday. And they have weddings on a Tuesday because of the passage I just read you. There are two acts of creation on the third day. And so Jewish people take that as a blessing. There's a double blessing on the third day. And so they will get married on the Tuesday. There you are. Uh, no need to take an extra offering for that. And I just realized that I forgot to say welcome to everyone online. I thank you for joining us today. Come on, Causeway. Let's give them a welcome. It's great to have you with us. Where do we go? Where do we go? Do, 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 do. Then God said, let the light appear in the sky and separate today and night. And God created the sun and the moon. And, uh, and God set the lights in the sky and the light in the earth and to govern the day and the night and it separated the light from the darkness and God saw that it was... I think you're getting it. Okay, day four. And then God said, let the waters swarm with snapper and kawai and kingfish and mahi-mahi and marlin and, um, and let the skies be filled with mallards and greys and paradise ducks and, and Canadian geese. And then God saw it was... That's the CRC version just there, okay. And he made the animals. And at the end of that, he said, it was good. I think you've got it. And now here we are. This is what I want you to lock on from the very start. And then God said, let... Let us. Hang on a minute. Oh, I skipped that a bit there just to save time. Yeah, just, you're not in Canada skiing now. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 26, then God said, let us, really important, make human beings in our image to be like. And then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. Day six, what did he do day seven? Had rest. And God puts man in this perfect garden, in this perfect place. And then God said something that was really kind of strange. He said something's not good. We've had all this good, 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 good. And now he says something's not good. After creating man, did God realize that man had no one to do life with? To celebrate with? to laugh with, to cry with, no one to enjoy life with, no one to watch cricket with. You guys get it. So it says in Genesis 2, 20, 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and while the man slept, the Lord took out one of the man's ribs. I always like spare ribs. And closed up the opening then the Lord God made the woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. This is cool. And the man says, at last. The man exclaimed. 
ooh la la. How cool is this? I'm sick of looking at an elephant. So let's jump back to 126. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Did you notice what God didn't say? He didn't say, let me make mankind in my image. He said, let us make man in our image. The use of a plural noun again, and it's used multiple times. Now, it's hard for me to get my head around this, but I realize that God himself is never alone. We're going to do a little bit of theologically deep geek here for a minute, okay? God lives in perfect community. God is God, and he lives in three distinct personalities in one. And in church, we call it the Trinity. And, and God is one, and yet he is in community. We're going somewhere with this church, okay? You're thinking, okay, let's ring some, the people up in white coats and get him taken away, okay? He is one being, and yet he is God the Father. He is God the Son. And he is God the Holy Spirit that we have with us today. And God, uh, if you want to read a psalm on this, um, Psalm 22. And if you read it just carefully, there's a conversation taking place between the three parts of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, they've all got lines each. And it's actually a prophetic psalm. It, it's a psalm that talks about crucifixion before crucifixion was a form of execution. And Jesus quotes from Psalm 22 on the cross. So there's just some homework for you. And... So why did this community, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, this one being, create man? God didn't create man because he was lonely. God created us because he is love. He is in community and he is love. And love isn't just what he does, it's who he is. And he is in a community of love and he created you to know him. That's why it says in, uh, in Matthew 22, when Jesus was asked, you know, what are the greatest commandments? Jesus replied, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And there's this amazing statement, a whole Sunday sermon right here. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. So in other words, we are to love God all in for our benefit. And we are to love the person sitting next to us. Some of you, that might be easy. Some of you, it might be a challenge. We are to love the person sitting in front of us or we are to love the person sitting behind us. Whatever qualifies as your neighbor, which is pretty much everybody. Right, okay, there's the theology. Right, let's carry on. So Harvard University does lots of studies all over long periods of time, and, uh, and some of them are fascinating reading. You can go online and look at some of these studies, and they've been doing one study for 85 years. And it began in 1938, and it's followed families, and it's followed their offspring or their descendants, and this was the topic. What is the key to happiness and long life? Okay. And so the researchers regularly collected data. They checked health records, the markers. They measured the physical and mental well-being. They met face-to-face -to, -face to observe the behavior and living conditions. And the, what they discovered, that success um, and career and money or anything that our current culture might tell you wasn't the reason for happiness and a long life. The reason for happiness and long life is health, healthy relationships in community. Okay, I thought that was a pretty amazing point, but obviously it's not. Healthy, and we had a party going on next door all night down the valley, and we had this music blaring all night. So I'm not quite on my game, but I'm on my, I'm on my game better than you are, okay? It was a healthy relationships and community was a key to happiness and long life. Surprise, surprise. God knew that. We were created for relationships. And we were created firstly for relationship with him, love the Lord your God, and we are created for relationship with everyone else. And we are created to live in community. 
And so God never intended for you to live in isolation. We covered it last week just briefly, that if, God, if people get offended, particularly with the church, and then they go into isolation, Satan's got them right where he wants them, he will chew them up and spit them out. And I, I recommended a book by John Sevier called John Brevere called The Bait of Satan. Great book. It'll explain that to you. And listen, we all get offended. But what we do with it? Do we hold on to it or do we let it go? And, um, and all, we all need this core group of intimate relationships. And when I use the word intimate, I'm not talking about sexual. That's, that's husband and wife. Um, and when I talk about we all need this core group of intimate relationships to support us and encourage us to take our next steps in God. And we all have needs in life. We, and we need someone and we need relationships to, to help meet those needs. We all have hurts to share and need someone to listen who makes you laugh? Who do you call to go and see a movie? Who do you do road trips with? Who do you turn to in a moment of crisis? Who encourages you? I, I got a text. I was up in the office. I go to the office early and just work on this. And here's the text. Looking forward to your word today. Preach it. Be bold. Man, I just sucked in a whole lot of air and let's go, baby. Okay? Who knows every detail of your life? Because when we have secrets that are concealed, they will always have power over us. And we will never be free. Who can you have a sound off to? Who likes to have a sound off? You know, who, who, can have a, who can you have a meltdown with? And the relationship never changes. They just love you. You do need to have someone that you can have a sound off to and a meltdown to. Who will come and visit you in jail? It's actually a serious statement because that's your friend. There's a few people being in church ministry, particularly in the United States, <laughs> who found themselves in jail. They've been inappropriate with money. And I've read a few of their books and they were shocked who came to visit them and it wasn't their friends. It was other pastors and sometimes very high profile pastors that reached out and extended a hand of grace because we have a loving heavenly father who reaches out and extends a hand of grace to us. So not a silly question. So in week one, we looked at the book of Acts. And uh, after, I don't want to rush over this, after Jesus gave us precious life for you and I. And then God raised him from the dead and we're only weeks away from celebrating that. And he, he, a few of his followers, they kind of gathered, and then Peter, who screwed it up, gets up and preaches the word of God, and it says 3,000 people were saved. And this new, this new church, as we'll call it, or the ecclesia, um, people of the way, they embraced this new community, and it was essential for the part, next part of their next steps. And they put into practice those two commandments. They loved God, and they loved each other. In fact, an Acts of Twos shows us something incredibly powerful about how they hung out. It says in Acts 2.46, how often did they meet? Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Oh, God, Sunday again, I've got to go to church. Attitude. <laughs> they got together every day. Why? Because they needed each other. And it said they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. That's not just celebrating Passover or what we call communion. That's actually just having meals together and hanging out and having fun. Community. And it said they were praising God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. Every day these crazy Jesus followers met together. And it was so much more than physical proximity. There was an emotional connection. There was unity. Why did they meet so often? 
because they needed each other. And back then, it's not like today, everything's cruisy. No problems. We've got no society problems. We've got no government problems. We've got no nasty people. There's no murder. Uh, the economy's in good shape. The banks are in good shape. Eggs are cheap. <laughs> See, the culture in the Acts 2 church was incredibly difficult. They were under huge persecution. Back then, they cared for each other. Those that had a lot helped those that didn't have much. They were devoted to the word of God. They prayed together. Those that were hurting were supported. They didn't do life alone. They did life in community where people who, with people who loved them. And together, they shared God's word, and it said they had glad and sincere hearts. And, and I love that, you know, they, they had joy. We sang about it this morning. They had joy even in the circumstances were difficult. And so today I want to try and show you what I believe is a fundamental difference between the first century followers of Jesus and the followers of Jesus today. And I, th I think the fundamental difference between the early church and today is the se first century believers needed each other. And can I suggest to you, nothing's changed. Believers today, we need each other. We are going into a period of time where we are going to need each other. And I think we have drifted off course just one degree. And as we move into the last days and as this going gets rough, we don't have to fear, but this Acts 2 church was strong because they were in community. And they knew they needed community and they know they needed close relationships. And nothing has changed, church. It's exactly the same today. Except I believe we've drifted off course. And the counselor was telling me many people are intentionally seeking independence and isolation. Meaning I don't need anyone. I can do life very well on my own. I don't have to rely on anyone. I can do life without relationships and community. And, I, and I'm, I'm not knocking social media, but social media has contributed to this. And you can have friends on, friends on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and every other thing that's out there. But you can keep them at arm's length. And if you, someone posts something you don't like, delete. You're gone. And we can now have friends without real community and without real interaction. Are you with me, church? Are you hearing my heart here? I can work from home. I can shop online. I can bank online. Well, I hope the bank's still got money because there is a, a crunch coming as we move to a digital currency and cashless, okay? The Bible told you, so don't be shocked, okay? I can have family and friends online. I can have church online. There is a place for that. And the counselor said this. People are intentionally pursuing a life that destroys their mental health and robs them of the real joy and lasting fulfillment. People are intentionally pursuing a life that destroys their, their mental health and robs them of real joy and lasting fulfillment. That's exactly what the Harvard University study said. They're intentionally pursuing a life that's the very opposite of what God intended for you. God never intended it to be that way. And listen, COVID hasn't helped. COVID did incredible damage with lockdowns and masks and social distancing and division over the vaccine and loneliness and fear. And we're still recovering from that. In fact, I've just spoke to a man this week. He still won't leave his home. It stopped community. It didn't stop my community. I had a very unreliable car. It would just go for a drive and it would seem to break down outside our friend's house. So I'd get out and pick up the bonnet and just check the oil and the water and then our mysterious friends would just come out, hi, hi. True story. <laughs> and my mysterious friends would go walking 
Long walks. <laughs> oh, there's friends outside. Social distancing. Come on, man. Hey, when, when in the Second World War, what happened? You just go underground. Just push back. So while social media has a good side, one thing that's happened is it's contributed to the isolation. And now my community can be on screen. We can live on screens. We can tweet and we can text. God never intended it to be that way. We need to see a face and we need to hear a voice in the room. Yeah. I remember my Anne and I lost our, five, our four parents in five years. And uh, my dad's death knocked me over a bit. He died in Rotorua in the hospital and I got to lead him to the Lord moments before he died. And the Holy Spirit came in and just whisked them, whisked them away and my, all the bells and whistles on the machine were going off and the hospital people come in. I said, it's okay, he's gone. He's changed the dress. And I remember he didn't want a public funeral so we, had a, we just had a kind of private funeral but with his family and my mum's family, that's quite a lot of people. You've heard about wedding crashes? Well, have you heard about funeral crashes? There were people that crashed that funeral. They were my community. They were my friends. And I, I, I took my dad's service and I, I, I choked up at the start. Blubbering mess. But I got there. And the same with mum. Do you know what it meant to me? I wasn't worried about all the relatives that I have nothing to do with and never see. Oh, is that just me? Okay. <laughs> When I saw their faces, we didn't do any hugs, they were blokes. Incredible comfort when I saw my community in the room, face to face, funeral crashes. Incredibly comfort. Last night, if you, uh, last Sunday night, if you're at the prayer meeting, incredibly powerful prayer meeting and I got a little tap on the shoulder and I had to leave the meeting just at, before the end you may have noticed and, uh, and, and I got a little message Colin there's someone outside wants to see you and his name's Dave precious Dave and he had a not, a, not, not their own son I think it was their nephew or something and he came and stayed the, when he was having a rough patch of life and he came to youth with my daughter and, um, and we became fond of him and uh, his name was Jordan and uh, Jordan died suddenly uh, 33 thereabouts uh, just this week or last week and Dave came to church and he wanted to see Colin and I hugged him and he sobbed and um, I couldn't go to the funeral but I, I, I rang them before and I rang them yesterday and asked them how they were because it was like their own son had died we need people in the room we need to hear a voice we don't necessarily need to text. Is fine, yes. No, meet you at ten o'clock. Fine, but we need to hear. We need to have community. Yep. Have I made that kind of point? Yep. Okay, let's get going. Um, I just wanted to tell you um, this week we're, we're nearly com the site works for the new church have nearly completed, and if you go and have a look, the car park's nearly completed. And I was sitting in the office this week, and I was thinking of you guys. Why was I thinking of you? Because every truck that went past three thousand. 6,000, 9,000, 12,000, 15,000, 18,000, all the millionaires online are listening. 100,000, 150,000, 200,000. Listen, in the new church, we have deliberately designed the foyer it's only slightly smaller than this building. Why? Because community and connection takes place in the foyer, not the pews or the rows or the chairs. And so my vision is that when service is finished, no one rushes to leave. And because that's where church happens, in the foyer not the auditorium. Community happens in the foyer. And even when we hit 500 and we've got to go to two services, we've got room to change over so community can happen in the foyer. 
connection and relationships happen in the foyer. Come on, let's just praise God for all the money he's given us and the money that's going to come and build us. And you have to know and, and understand that this connection never happens by accident. It happens because we're intentional. I'm a petrol head, and, and, and I see a fancy car in Mangawai. It might be a McLaren or a, um, a Mustang. <coughs> Excuse me. Just need a drink. Just need a drink. I'll just walk across the road and start a conversation with the owner. Ask them for the keys. I'm intentional. What do you do? And then they ask you, what do you do? I said, well, if I tell you that, you'll never talk to me again. So now I've really hooked them in. I tell people about Jesus and how much he loves you and how much God loves you. Okay, I've got to keep going. I've only got five minutes. Um, so one of the ways we do this intentionally at Causeway Church is through our small groups. And, um, and, and sometimes I wonder if we haven't quite grabbed this yet and we've still got the old concept of the midweek Bible study, we four and no more. And, and we don't have that. We have a free market policy here. And um, you can change um, small groups each term. And, you know, just to, as the church gets bigger, the church has to get smaller. And that's how we do it. And new believers need a place to belong and to come to and to be discipled. Can I ask you, who's discipling you? Who are you discipling? And I, I want to create a culture where small groups will always be a gathering of grace. You are welcome without judgment. And the Apostle Paul said this in Philippians 1 7. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. You remain partners with me in this wonderful grace of God. And small groups are a safe place to come to where we can connect, a safe place to belong to, where everyone knows your name. It's a gathering of grace. And I believe life change happens in small groups. And your questions are welcome, your doubts are welcome, your hurts are welcome, your your baggage is welcome. We've all got it. Your laughter's welcome. You're just welcome. And that is why it's a gathering of grace. I also believe Causeway Church small groups need to be a gathering of healing. And so while God can physically heal, often the small group can be a place for emotional healing and, and, and spiritual healing. Um, and we kind of think we go to God for healing, and that's kind of right. God can heal, but we've learned last week that what he did with that to say to the young man who was crippled on the mat, he said, your sins are forgiven. He didn't go for forgiveness, he went for healing. And when we confess our sins to God, he forgives us. I love this verse, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all the mess. And when we confess our needs and our hurts to another person, then healing takes place in community. In fact, Scripture says it, James 5, 16. Therefore, get off your chest your brokenness and your hurts and your struggles, the word sin, to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Oh my goodness. That takes place in community of small groups. And we come into this gathering of grace. There's a place of healing. We pray for one another and somehow God uses other people to bring healing. It's a gathering of grace. It's a gathering of healing. And last one, I don't want you to miss it either. We gather because it's a gathering of purpose. I don't know if you've ever looked in the scriptures, but there's about 60 verses that said um, one another. About 60 different verses. I'm going to give you five and then I'm, then I'm done. Okay? It's a gathering of purpose. We have been created on purpose for a purpose to make a difference. Acts 2.46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They needed each other. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And look what happened. And the Lord added to their number daily. A prophetically church, I don't think we're quite ready for what's coming. I want to get you ready. 
This was a community that was so in love with Jesus that the other people saw the love of Jesus, wanted the love of Jesus, and the Lord added to their number daily. Every single day, people were being added, people were being saved. So we have a purpose. 60 different one another verses. I'm going to look at five. Galatians 5, 13. Serve humbly with love, in love. How be the church? Purpose. You can't do this just by scrolling on a phone or an email. We're called to serve one another. Jesus modeled it for us. What else are we called to do? First Peter 4. Offer hospitality to... Can't do that on a phone. Acts 2, they intentionally gathered, they had meals together, and when was the last time you had someone in your home? Last week we learned about if the door was open, you were welcome. Is your door open? Have you invited someone who's far from God? We're called to, in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to 60 of them. I'm only going to give you five. Can I tell you, church, it's getting ugly out there. And we're also called, therefore, encourage one another. First Thessalonians 4.18. Anyone need encouragement? I'm guessing the person sitting right next to you needs encouragement. I love to walk around at pack down or set up and just encourage the teams. Hebrews 3.13. Be encu- but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. Let's make a point of this week. I don't mean I don't mean cheesy fake. I mean how can I genuinely encourage? It's your purpose. Like literally the person sitting right next to you now may need encouragement. And here's the last one. Galatians six two. We are called to carry a burden shared is a burden halved. In this last rain that Mangawai had, um, I know a lot of people copped damage. Anne and I copped quite a lot of damage on our farm. It was amazing that my small group and some friends turned up to help me fix it. Broken water lines, fences gone, culverts gone, roads damaged. And I loved just, and um, I took, they won't take any money, but I took one of the guys down to, the, to a service at the Potu Lighthouse Church. And 20 snapper jumped in the boat. It was a miracle. And it was amazing. I, was, I don't know if Mac's here today, but I was just with Mac, and he just, he just shared the pain when he, when he lost his wife with cancer and the reality of that and, how, and his faith. And it was just, and for once I shut up. You can laugh. And that's the community. It doesn't necessarily happen here. It happens in small groups and then on the sidelines when we get this right and be the church look out look out if we had authentic community in the body of Christ every hurting and broken person will hear the love of Jesus there will be always someone in need don't send them a text get in your car and knock on their door don't just go to church be the church We are the hands and feet of Jesus and the hands and feet of Jesus that bring the gospel. So Father, this morning I pray you will help us do your work. Father, I pray you stir us up to be what you want us to be. In Jesus' name.